بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد الطيب الطاهر الأمين وعلى آله وصحابته والتابعين له بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وبعد Hello brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'd like to welcome you to this, the third episode of our series, uh, Ramadan Gems, during which we uh, discuss and try to unpack some of the um, additional layers of understanding and meaning related to the month of Ramadan how we can benefit from this blessed month, how can we um, dissect the different components and the different elements of this month in order that we will um, uh, attain the best of the month. Oftentimes, when we just uh, try to fast without seeking to explore the ways that we can have a deeper experience with the fast. We end up, you know, with maybe a dry experience uh, because we've sort of put ourselves on this path, uh, which is a straight line. And we find ourselves, you know, in the beginning making a commitment and we sort of push ourselves and we go for about a week to 10 days. And then we find that enthusiasm is waning the momentum is uh, slowing down. And so exploring the different aspects of the fast, one of the benefits of that is that we enlighten ourselves to the possibilities of Ramadan because there are so many, many possibilities uh, to this month. And um, one of the sayings about the month of Ramadan is that Ramadan is Shahrul Barakah. Uh, the month of blessing. Another saying about the month of Ramadan is that Ramadan is Shahrul Khair, is the month of goodness. Another saying about the month of Ramadan is that Ramadan is Shahrul Quran, and the Quran is all goodness. It's the month of the Quran, and the Quran is all goodness. And then another saying is Shahrul Ramadan, Shahrul Law. So Ramadan is the month of Allah, meaning. It is the month in which Allah Ta'ala uh, increases everything uh, in multitudes. So the blessings, the opportunities, the rewards, all of these things are increased um, uh, and magnified significantly. And so it's pretty hard to miss out on these opportunities. And when you know about the different ways that you can maximize the spiritual reward of your fast, you tend to become more motivated. You tend to want to um, get every little piece that you can, so to speak, about from the month. Uh, so we've been looking at the month of Ramadan through the lens of the hadith of the Prophet وسلم, in which he says, <laughs> so he said, the month of Ramadan is a month in which the beginning of it is mercy. And in the first episode, we unpacked a little bit about what that means. The mercy of God, the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the manifestation of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the attribute of attributes of Allah, ar-Rahman and ar-Rahim, and how mercy is manifested by way of these two attributes. And then the human uh, attribute of mercy and how we can actualize it and how we can enhance it so that it, we can be connected to the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a deeper way. And then in episode two, we looked at the forgiveness of Ramadan. So we looked at the meaning of forgiveness. We looked at uh, forgiveness as it relates to uh, a, a, an extension of Allah's mercy to us. Because we talked about uh, how mercy is a covering 
And what Allah covers when he forgives us is our sins and our faults. Allah Ta'ala covers those things. And so we talked about how forgiveness is actually a form of covering the faults of other people. So when people transgress against us, when people violate, when people commit sins, and um, especially when they're directed towards us, and then we engage in the process of forgiveness, a part of what we're doing is covering these people. We're covering the person because a part of the sin of transgression, if the person is a decent person, if the person is you know, a normal human being, if the person is not an oppressor, there's an element of shame connected to this violation. And so forgiveness is when we cover their act, their transgression, thereby sparing them the shame and the humiliation that it becomes publicly known that they engaged in this violation or this act of transgression. And so in that regard, this is a part of what the attribute of Allah Ta'ala Al-Ghafoor means because Allah is the one who covers our sins through forgiveness. And likewise, we should seek to embody more of this attribute of forgiveness. Uh, and we talked about the fact that doing this is a lot easier to, saying this, I should say, is a lot easier to do than uh, doing it because of so much of the ego that's involved when you forgive someone because the transgression is against you. It's against, you know, against me. And, you know, if I am identified primarily through my ego, my, my ego self, my lower self, then the transgression hits a different way. But when I attempt to engage through my soul, which is an elevation above the physical, the ego, then I am able to look at the spiritual enhancing of my understanding of the nature of this uh, transgression or this violation. And I am able to understand that I am engaging in a form of struggle against my ego. And this is what Allah Ta'ala says in the Quran when he says, وَلَمَنْ صَبَرَ وَغَفَرَ إِنَّ ذَلِكَ لَمِنْ عَزْمِ الْأُمُورِ Whoever perseveres, whoever is patient when they are transgressed against. وَلَمَنْ صَبَرَ وَغَفَرَ And then they forgive. They forgive. They forgive. Right? إِنَّ ذَلِكَ لَمِنْ عَزْمِ الْأُمُورِ that that is indeed the heart of the matter or a, 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 a hard thing to do. But it is the convicted thing to do. It is the beautiful struggle that we must engage in, right? Because um, a part of our... Um, surrender to Allah Ta'ala is that we control our impulses and our base impulse as uh, physical humans, when we react to things, we react to stimuli, um, we tend to go low first because that is the animal instinct response, you know, that we want revenge. We want to get the person back, right? So engaging in the struggle of controlling that impulse and seeking out the higher calling, which is forgiveness, well, we have to engage in some work, right? And Ramadan is the perfect time to put ourselves to the test. So we talked about this uh, last week, and uh, now today... We want to explore some of the ideas around the end of the month because the Prophet ﷺ says, 
And so the end part of this blessed month is when there is an opportunity to be emancipated, emancipated from the hellfire. And so to understand this idea of emancipation from the hellfire, because this would suggest that um, there is a form of bondage or, or something that bonds us to the hellfire, right? So there's a form of, there's a chain, right? A metaphorical chain, right? Um, and I don't want to get into a lot of the, uh, the details around how we could explore this um, um, in terms of what it means to be a human being, right? What I want to do is look at what Allah Ta'ala says about, with a surety to us, that there is a potential to be bonded to the hellfire um, for every human. And so Allah Ta'ala says in another verse in the Quran, He says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. This is in Surah Maryam, Mary. Uh, Allah Ta'ala says, وَإِن مِّنْكُمْ إِلَّا وَارِدُهَا كَانَ عَلَىٰ رَبِّكَ حَتْمًا مَقْضِيًّا ثُمَّ نُنَجِّ الَّذِينَ اتَّقَوْا وَنَذَرُ الظَّالِمِينَ فِيهَا جِثِيًّا So Allah Ta'ala says, in reference to the hellfire, verily, وَإِن مِّنْكُمْ إِلَّا وَارِدُهَا Verily, you all, will enter it. Uh, I don't know if you all is the best translation here um, because it, it basically means there's an allotted portion of you in minkum. Some of you, I should say some of you, will be uh, dwellers of the fire. And Allah says, كَانَ عَلَىٰ رَبِّكَ حَتْمًا مَقْضِيًا This means this is bond. This is by Allah. This will happen. That there will be a, a portion of humanity who will reside, 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 a little tongue twisted here because of the fast, who will reside in the hellfire. Some for eternity. Right? This is a promise from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? So, Part of what the understanding of this is that we do not take for granted the fact that Allah Ta'ala says about himself that he is Rahman and Rahim. He is all forgiving, most compassionate. We should never take for granted and assume that we will be saved by virtue of something that we do or that we have uh, only reliance on God's mercy because the other part of Allah's attribute or attributes is that he is also capable of exacting vengeance and tormenting those who deserve to be tormented and punishing those who deserve to be punished, right? So the Quran speaks of the balance. In another verse, Allah says, Verily, your Lord is, his punishment is severe. And he led with that to remind us humans that our Lord is capable of punishing. He may not punish us, but this is not because we're not deserving of punishment. He may not punish us because, as he says about himself, وَرَحْمَتِي وَسِعَتْ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ My mercy encompasses all things, and it encompasses even the wrongdoers who are deserving of punishment. It perhaps is the case, in their case, that Allah's mercy will overcome the um, punishment, and therefore they are not punished. But in the other verse, when Allah says, that there will be an allotted portion of you who will go to hell. 
كان على ربك حتما مقضيه ان الله از assuring us that this is factual and true he said ثم ننجي الذين اتقوا and then we will rescue from within from from their in meaning the fire الذين اتقوا the ones who sought to be protected so there are two possibilities one is that even a a a, a believer who has done their share of wrongdoing may be punished in the hellfire because this is Allah's affair, right? So if a person on the day of accounting finds themselves with their bad deeds or their evil deeds outweighing their good deeds, this qualifies them for punishment in the hellfire. So they may end up being punished in the hellfire, right? And then Allah Ta'ala says, they will be rescued by virtue of their taqwa, their consciousness of God. And so they may have indulged in some things that they must be, that they must pay for. Because on some levels, the torment of the fire is purification. So they are purified from the residue of their wrongdoing. And then Allah Ta'ala rescues them and delivers them to paradise. And then we leave the ones who are who were um, insisting on wrongdoing. The ones who uh, their sin was their modus operandi. We leave them in the fire. Jithiya, for a term that we determine, right? And so uh, this sort of sets up the understanding that we believers have about the bondage to the hellfire because it is a possibility for everyone. So we don't have instant salvation. We don't have guaranteed salvation, right? We don't have guaranteed salvation. What we have is a guaranteed meeting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and a guaranteed accounting. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in a hadith that is graded as sound, وَإِن مِنْكُمْ إِلَّا رَبُّهُ وَبَيْنَهُ تَرْجُمَانِ the Prophet ﷺ said that that all of you will have an audience with your Lord. Your Lord will speak to you. And there will be no translator, no mediator. So this is a personal meeting with Allah. And so our efforts are in preparation for this meeting. So we that's the best. Outside of relying on the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, depending on the mercy of Allah, not on our deeds. Because our human inclination is to, you know, center all of this on me and what I'm doing. Look at what I did. Look at what I earned. And the Prophet Sallallahu guarantees us that we will earn everything or we will be granted everything, I should say, by the mercy and permission of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And this was to humble us, right? And so we also seek the protection of Allah from his punishment, not by declarations that I follow the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and I do everything right and so how can I be punished? You know, how can No, we do this by also pleading to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala by way of his attributes of mercy to emancipate, us, to emancipate us from the hellfire, to free us from the hellfire, right? This is us humbling ourselves before Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. 
because Allah tells us in the Quran, throughout the Quran, across the Quran, that we should what? Be conscious of the fire. In one verse in, in Ali Imran, the family of Imran, Surah 3, Allah says this emphatically. So there's no layers of interpretation here because this is an emphatic statement. This is not a request. This is not a question. You know, this is not a, a, a figurative question. This is an emphatic statement. This is a command. Meaning, by way of the English translation, be a, be, beware of the fire which has been prepared for those who reject the truth. So rejecting the truth has consequences. Rejecting the truth in the dunya is a choice that Allah gives everyone. And he guarantees this. This is why there is no compulsion in religion. This is why you can't make someone believe. This is why I can't make someone be a Muslim. This is why I can't take the belief uh, in Allah that I may have and implant it or transplant it in someone else's heart. Because every one of us has a choice. And Allah says this by the letter of the Quran. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Wa qulil haqqu min rabbikum fa man sha'a fal yu'min wa man sha'a fal yakfur. Allah says in Surah Al Kahf, the cave. Surah 16, he said, and say to them, meaning, O Prophet, say to the people, verily, the truth of the matter comes from your Lord. The truth, the ultimate truth, the real truth, the final truth comes from your Lord. And then he said about that, and so whosoever chooses, may accept the truth, may believe in the truth. And whosoever chooses can disbelieve in the truth. They don't have to accept the truth. This is why it is futile. It is folly to believe that we can spread the message of God even with a sword, even with a weapon, even by force. There's no such thing. And everything like this always represented the ambitions of human beings, not the commandments of Allah. The ambition of the human to expand his territory, to control and to uh, dominate another human being, another group of people by way of force even, right? All of this is human ambition. As it relates to the truth of God, it can only be spread the way that God tells us to spread it. Bilhikmati wal mawidatil hasana. Using wisdom and using good exhortation and using gentle, gentle reminding. This is the best that any of us can do. Now, having said all of that, that does not mean that there will not be consequences to rejecting the truth. But the determination of the consequences is not up to us because we are not the determiners of the consequences. We are not the judges. So we're not the judges over one another. And even if I judge an action of yours or you judge an action of mine, it's a partial judgment because a true judge is the one who has the authority to also deliver the punishment. And that only true judge is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so, determining the consequence, in fact, executing the consequence is the domain of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that because he is Lord, he is God, he is Rabb over all of this creation. And we all go back to him. We all answer to him. We all must stand before him. So from our point of view, um, our religious outlook, we don't have 
any form of guaranteed salvation. It doesn't matter who, how righteous a person is, how righteous a woman thinks she is, how, how righteous a man believes he is, how righteous I believe someone is, right? There are no guarantees. The only guarantee is the guarantee that comes from Allah to someone, like in the case of the companions of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, like the prophets themselves, who were the uh, conveyors of the message, right? They have guarantees, right? So the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Prophet Isa, alayhi salam, Prophet Musa, these individuals, Sayyida Maryam, Sayyida Fatima, these people have guarantees. But these guarantees are delivered to them in a, not, in a way that reminds them to, humble, to be humble for their gift. So this is a spiritual gift. It's a special spiritual gift. The companions of the Prophet وسلم, the women and the men that he said were guaranteed salvation. Guaranteed paradise. People like Sayyidina Ali, radiallahu an. People like Sayyidina Umar, radiallahu an. People like Sayyidina Uthman. People like Sayyidina Abu Bakr and others. Who say people like Sayyidina Bilal, Ibn Rabah, radiallahu an. The Mu'addin in the Prophet's Masjid, who Allah said to the Prophet to tell Bilal that he will have a Masjid in. Jannah, and he will call the Adhan in that mission. These all represent guarantees. But the general populace, the general believer, even the biggest from the biggest sheikh to the, the, the smallest believer, there is no guarantee. And the Prophet ﷺ was sure to inform his companions of this. When he told them, لَن يَدْخُلَ الْجَنَّةَ أَحَدٌ مِّنْكُمْ بِعَمَلِهِ He said to his companions that none of you will go to the paradise by virtue of your actions alone. Meaning, don't get hung up on what you think you're doing. Because this is not a guarantee that just because you did it, this not transactional in that manner. You did it, therefore you, you're going to paradise. No. There's always the uncertainty of the believer that what I do is just not enough. It's not good enough. It's not quantifiably enough. It's not sincere enough. It's not enough. And so I don't have this sense of self-satisfaction because the self-satisfaction leads me to self-righteousness. And self-righteousness is a sin because it leads to arrogance. Allah said, فَلَا تُزَكُّوا أَنفُسَكُمْ هُوَ أَعْلَمُ بِمَنْ اتَّقَى Don't do tezkiyah of yourself. Don't proclaim yourselves righteous. Don't do that. Because Allah truly knows who is righteous and who is not. So you and I are doing the best that we can. And we should keep this mentality. No matter how much we learn, how many books we read, how many sheikhs we study under, how many times we read the Quran, how many times we read hadith, how much we think we're doing, right? We should always keep this energy that what I'm doing is potentially not good enough for my salvation. And so I will retain my humility. So imagine the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam are hearing from him that none of them will go to Jannah by virtue of their actions alone. And so they were quite naturally surprised and they said, Ya Rasulullah, 
I mean, you mean it, you tell us not even you? Wala anta? And he said to them, which is the point of the matter here. So we're going to underscore it. He said, Wala ana, illa an yatagamadani lahu bi rahmatim minhu wa fadl. He said, not even me, unless God, unless God engulfs me in his mercy and graciousness. Underscore that. Unless we are engulfed in the mercy of Allah and we are covered and embraced in the graciousness of Allah, there's no guarantee. So take off the cloak of self-righteousness. Drop the language that somehow you are saved, right? Because we don't do that. We don't, we're not, salvation is not a mere utterance of words. Because what that could mean for us is my actions are inconsequential. I can do whatever because I uttered these words. No. And so a part of seeking emancipation from the hellfire takes into the account, takes into account all of the potential that we have to find ourselves on the wrong side of the scale on the day of the accounting. Find ourselves with the wrong side of the scale leaning heavily. And we will be at the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So a part of what we do to lay, to plant the seedlings, right? To prepare the, the ground that we will stand on the day of on the day of the accounting is to humble ourselves and to ask Allah for emancipation from his punishment. Beware of the fire. Be conscious of the fire that Allah has prepared for those who are wrongdoers. Beloved brothers and sisters, we do this out of emulation, in emulation uh, of our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who himself sought refuge from the fire, even though he had a guarantee that he would not go to the fire. I repeat. We are emulating Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who sought refuge in Allah from the fire in spite of him having guarantees, assurances. You want proof? What do you think Surah Al-Kawthar is about? Allah Ta'ala said to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam inna a'tayna kal kawthar Verily we have given you al kawthar what is Al Kawthar? Al Kawthar is a river. Where is this river? Was it in Mecca? No. Was it in Medina? No. Al Kawthar is not a part of this earthly existence. Al Kawthar is a river in Jannah. And Allah said to the Prophet, Verily, we have given you a river in paradise. Is this not a guarantee? This is a guarantee. This is a guarantee. This is one of the guarantees of the Prophet Wasallam. Another one of the guarantees that he will be in a position of salvation is that he has the ability to uh, pray for our salvation, to speak on our behalf, known as intercession. Intercession, known as a shafa'ah. And Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will be empowered to do shafa'ah for his uh, followers. Allah Ta'ala says in the Quran, وَلَا تَنْفَعُ الشَّفَاعَةُ عِنْدَهُ إِلَّا لِمَنْ أَذِنَ لَهُ 
Allah says that there will become a day, meaning the day of the accounting, when interceding, meaning pleading to Allah, oh Allah, spare us, spare us, will be of no benefit except for the ones that have been granted permission. So this suggests that there will be some who will have permission to seek intercession for others. And at the head of those people is Muhammad Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam We are told in the hadith tradition That the Prophet Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will have a, There will be a moment Where he will It will be said to him Washfa' to shafa' So ask for intercession And you will be given permission To uh, Ask for intercession Or to grant intercession So the Prophet وسلم, who had this assurance, think about this. He had this, those assurances that I just mentioned, and many others, is also reported to have said, Allahumma inna qawlaka al haq wa wa'daka haq wa al jannatu haq wa al naru haq. So he said, O oh Lord, I bear witness that your word is true, meaning your Quran, what you have said to us in the Quran, to your creation is true. Your promise is true. Your paradise is true and the fire is true. So Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is affirming these things. Allah's word, the truth of Allah's word, the truth of Allah's promise, and then the truth of al-Jannah and al-Nar. And so for our salvation, we can do no better than affirming the truth of these two things. These four things, but the two, al-Jannah and al-Nar, because Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam affirmed that they are true. Because Allah Ta'ala said, uh, jannati khalidina fiha. Some people will be in Jannah and some be- people, he said it emphatically. Fariqun fil Jannah, a group of people will be in Jannah, wa fariqun fil Sa'ir, and then a group of people will be in the fire. So we affirm whatever Allah said to be. That is the safest spiritual position we don't need to in, engage in interpretation seeking out other interpretations other meanings because this is direct language this is not figurative language this is direct emphatic speech and some of it relates to things that we have no way to conceptualize because we have not been given access to the elements of the unseen that Allah is Lord of as well. So the best position for us is Taslim. And we follow the Prophet وسلم, who said, Al Jannah to Haq wal Haq. But even more than that, the Prophet وسلم, said, and he taught us to say, Allahumma inni a'udhuka, a'udhu bika min al nari. وَمَا قَرَّبَ إِلَيْهَا مِنْ قَوْلٍ وَعَمَلٍ So a part of a hadith in which he asked for paradise أَسْأَلُكَ الْجَنَّةِ وَمَا قَرَّبَ إِلَيْهَا مِنْ قَوْلٍ وَعَمَلٍ وَأَعُوذُ بِكَ مِنَ النَّارِ وَمَا قَرَّبَ إِلَيْهَا مِنْ قَوْلٍ وَعَمَلٍ I seek refuge, I ask you for paradise and anything that uh, makes, takes me close to it of word or deed and I seek refuge in you from the fire and anything that t- uh, takes me close to it of word or deed, or of word and deed. So the Prophet وسلم, sought refuge from the fire and then he taught us to seek refuge from the fire. Therefore, we should seek refuge from the fire. This is the safest spiritual stance, spiritual state, spiritual position we can take. This is the safest thing for us. 
And so during these last 10 days of Ramadan, when we are told that uh, people are emancipated, meaning that you're, you are freed, right? Um, because you have the, 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 the um, you are lessening your chances, right? You start with asking Allah Ta'ala to be free from the fire. So you say that dua. I seek refuge in, in you, O oh Allah, from the fire and anything that brings me close to it in of word and deed. That's the start. That's where you start. This is freedom from the bondage of the hellfire. This is true emancipation. It is spiritual emancipation. There's physical emancipation. And then there's spiritual emancipation. And during the month of Ramadan, we seek refuge in Allah. We ask Allah to grant us this spiritual emancipation. Na'udhu becoming a na'ud. So we seek refuge in Allah from the, the hellfire. And Allah tells us in the Quran that this is the du'a of the believers. The believers who are balanced. Because some of us believers, we have short-sightedness, right? And so we know that we should be investing in the dunya and the akhirah. And our investment in the dunya is the investment that will lead, the best investment in the dunya is the investment that will benefit us in the akhirah. We know this, and in spite of that, we invest heavily in the dunya and then some for the akhirah. And Allah says, فَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ يَقُولْ رَبَّنَا آتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا They say, oh Allah, give us of the good of the world وَمَا لَهُ فِي الْآخِرَةِ مِنْ خَلَاقِ And then in the next life, they find themselves shorthanded because they didn't ever invest enough. Then he said about the ones who have the balance, وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ يَقُولْ And then there are them, those of them who say, رَبَّنَا آتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا حَسَنًا O oh Allah, give us good in this life, وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ حَسَنًا And give us good in the next life. And they add to that, وَقِنَا عَذَابَ النَّارِ And protect us from the torment of the fire. This is a dua that we want to say. We are now in the waning days of Ramadan. We're going to sneeze. And by this time next week, Ramadan is done and gone. And all we have is what we did or didn't do. Right? And then we have the six days of Shawwal, which I encourage you, if you are able to, uh, after this marathon of fasting, to dig deep and to add on the six days of Shawwal. Add on the six days of Shawwal. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Man Sama Ramadan, Thumma Atba'ahu Bisitim Min Shawwal, Faka Anna Ma Qama Bisayam Adahar, O Kama Qala Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So something to the effect, because I'm not sure of the exact quote of the hadith, and I will, um, Upload that in, an, in another recording. But he said that whoever fasts the month of Ramadan and then follows it up with the six of Shawwal, it is the equivalent of the uh, perpetual fast known as Siyam Dawood. And Siyam Dawood is when uh, Sayyidina Dawood, Prophet David, would fast a day and, and take off a day. This is the ambitious fast. Right, the, the highly motivated spiritual fast. You get an equal reward. So you should try to do the six of Shawwal. Right? But that's it. Once Ramadan is over, you hope to get some of the extra goodies that are attached to Ramadan in Shawwal. But while we are in the last 10 days, and while we are still in the month of Ramadan, we must take advantage of everything to the best of our ability. 
And as I mentioned from the very beginning, what this means is even if you find yourself at the end of Ramadan not having done all of the things that you set out to do, do not do not permit yourself to now fall into a funk, you know, a, a, a post-Ramadan depression because I said I was going to do this or I said I was going to do that and I didn't do it. No, you should feel assured by the promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you will be rewarded not just for what you did, but what, what, what you intended to do, providing that you didn't just blow it off. You weren't just saying some words that you had no intention of carrying out because that's a different story. But if you said words of deep intention that I'm going to do this during Ramadan, I'm going to try to do that during Ramadan, and then for whatever reason, you weren't able to do it, but it wasn't because you weren't serious guess what? Allah Ta'ala rewards for your intention. So you should feel uh, hopeful and optimistic, right? Uh, even if you fell short. Even if you said you were going to do a lot, but you could only muster up the energy to do, it, to do a little. Be hopeful because your little during the month of Ram Ramadan is a lot. So the little that we do is a lot. Just like Allah Ta'ala tells us about the night of power. Laylatul Qadri Khairun min Alfi Shahr. So one night is equivalent to a thousand months. So the reward of the an action, a small action in, in the one night of Laylatul Qadr is the equivalent to the reward of actions performed across a thousand months. So keep it positive, but be sincere in your intention, right? Because this is how you can um, benefit from, from this, um, what I just said, that you're sincere in your intention, right? And so we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to uh, give us protection that Allah Ta'ala answers this prayer that we make. Allahumma innaka afuun tuhibbul afwa fa'fu anna. O oh Lord, you are afu. You are most compassionate, most forgiving. And you love to forgive. So we ask you to forgive us. And then we say, Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa qina adab al nar. O oh Lord, give us of the good of this world and give us of the good of the next world, and protect us, O oh Allah, from the torment of the fire. These two du'as, these two prayers, we should say them frequently throughout the night and throughout the day of these last waning days of the month of Ramadan, and ask specifically for that in order that we may benefit, inshallah, from and be emancipated from the torment of the fire. Uh, thank you, beloved brothers and sisters, for uh, tuning in during this broadcast of Ramadan Gems. And inshallah, we will see you in another episode soon. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh wa Ramadan Mubarak.